Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Renske Telozen, Head of Marketing here at Dapper, and I'm so glad you're all with us here today for this third edition of Dapper Deep Dives. I would like to give you a short introduction of Dapper and why we find it important to organize Dapper Deep Dives before handing over to Miriam, who will be your host of today. Well, at Dapper, our mission is to really, really kick single-use plastic water bottles out of this world. Our mission to fight plastic pollution started 11 years ago and unfortunately is still very relevant today because without action, the annual flow of plastic into the ocean will nearly triple by 2040. Well, put it differently, by 2040, every meter of our world's coastline will be covered with 50 kilograms of plastic. Wow. Now, why are we fighting single-use plastic water bottles specifically here at Dopper? Because frankly, it's a no-brainer to us. Here in the Western world, we have amazing quality of water coming right out of the tap. So there's no need to buy it in plastic. At Dopper, our mission is to empower people to change their behavior, to drink water from the tap wherever they can, and to choose a reusable bottle over a single-use plastic one. Now, how do we do this? By producing a kick-ass reusable water bottle, if I may say, in the most sustainable way we know how, by raising awareness of plastic pollution and offering educational programs. And we have the Dopper Wave, our global community of wave makers who join us in standing up against single-use plastic bottles. And it's ranging from individuals to small local shops to multi-million dollar businesses, all have pledged to ban single-use bottles from their yoga classes, their daily commutes, their offices, their restaurants. And so far, we have more than 430,000 drops in our wave. And we would love you to join our wave change as well. Now, as the Dopper Wave shows, here at Dopper, we believe in making impact together, together with others. We want to inspire people to all be change makers for a more sustainable future. And now, going to Dopper Deep Dives, it's our digital talk series designed to do just that, to inspire one another and to spark curiosity and discussion. This is our way of giving a platform to think out loud and out of the box on how we can change and create a better future together, one conversation at a time. And today, I will hand over to Miriam, our impact marketeer from Germany, who will be your host for today. I wish you all a very inspiring session. Thank you so much for the introduction, Renske. Um, great to have you all here at our third Stop a Deep Dive. And first of all, I want to send out a really, really warm welcome to our amazing, badass speakers. And of course, in welcome you all that are listening at home or wherever you are. I really wish we would be there in person. I would love to see you all. I'm just looking at my screen at the moment. But the advantage of this is that you are able to listen or watch this wherever you are in the world. So to start with, if you like, drop in the chat on your right where you're based. So we know a little bit where in the, every corner in the world we're currently watching. And let's start with the boring things first. A couple of things for housekeeping. If you have any questions at any point to any of the speakers or a Dopper question, just drop them in the chat and we collect them. Secondly, um, each of the speakers will present a short presentation and afterwards there's time for one question. And then in the end, we will have a Q&A. So all the questions that are not answered yet, there's a chance to ask them to the, to the speakers. Um, if some of the questions aren't answered today, we will of course collect them, send them an email, and you can later um, get the answers. If you have to leave early, no hard feelings, um, just leave, we record the whole session and you can watch it later online. All right, I think this year started and we were all really looking forward to move on, to be done with 2020, and then nothing really changed, right? It felt like it's actually kind of the same. Um, and I think we were all really ready to move on. I think by now we pretty much all in a pandemic plus minus a year. And it was really time for some change and this new year's resolution feeling that didn't really kick in. But I really believe in that in every challenge, there is an opportunity for creativity and for change. So that's why we dubbed this edition radical solutions. So really thinking forward looking and thinking of new ideas. And that's why today we have invited three wonderful, amazing speakers, and I would say three badass speakers. Um, 
that are really, really focusing on change. And I think I can speak on, on behalf of the whole DOPA team that we are so looking forward to learn from them, to be inspired, to be curious and to listen to what ideas they have in mind. So I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers to you. Our first speaker today is Lily Stark. She's the communication manager at Tomorrow Bank, and that's um, a fellow B Corp. They're based in Germany. Quickly translate this for you. It says, imagine there's war and no one is financing it. So you see already, right? They're thinking badass, really a, bit, a start of a revolution of the finance market. So I'm very curious what they have to say. Then our second speaker is going to be Lisa Rose. She is the head of impact at Water Bear. If you haven't joined Water Bear, you better do now. She is responsible for nonprofit partnerships, community mobilization, and has worked in the past with, for example, just to drop a few names, Greenpeace, Avas, and Patagonia. So very curious and really looking forward to learn from her and from her experience. And then last but not least, we have the wonderful Lola Segas from Youth for Climate, or better known, Fridays for Future. And I'm sure that's a name that everyone has heard before. It's an absolute honor to actually virtually meet her and uh, to hear more about the movement. Um, without further ado, I would now like to invite our first speaker. Lily, if you want to start your presentation or be starting that for you, if you could unmute yourself with your video. Yes, here I am. Hello, nice to meet you. So you are starting the slides now, I guess? Yes. Here we are, you can click through it. And here we go. It's really nice to meet you, all of you guys, um, and um, pretty um, keen to uh, discuss later on. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a few words about um, tomorrow. So again, hi, I'm Lily from Hamburg Calling, Hamburg St. Pauli, and um, the really north of Germany. And we are here working on a really, really big topic, as Miriam just um, also introduces, on um, yeah, revolutionizing the finance industry. And um, but starting for, from the first point, um, demonstrating is a big thing for for the for the generation Y and for for all our generation it should be. I'm pretty um, keen to listen to Lola's um, perspective later, but. Um, yeah, coming by coming back to us as um, even if we're yeah, more like demonstrating um, behind the screen in pandemic times, um, usually people go to the streets and and they're striking because they want to. They are striking for a better future, and, and they want to contribute to a better future. As I think everyone should. I, as Lily, who's not trying to not use the car and not eating meat and so on. All of us who are thinking about um, better solutions for the future and also businesses do have an impact on our future. And um, we at Tomorrow, um, uh, uh, B Corp, we want to ensure that our future looks um, green, diverse, healthy, and um, therefore we are building a digital bank. And um, one can ask, why do we need a digital bank uh, this is, that is sustainable? because um, we are told and taught not to talk about money, but um, money has an effect and um, banks are working with customers money and every day and every minute and they're hiding somehow the, um, what they are working on with our money. And as you can see here, since 2016, we all know the Paris Agreement um, there's like a huge of amount of money. No one, also I at least can't even imagine how much money it is um, going into fo fossil fuels. And um, this is happening with our money lying on conventional banks. And uh, those banks are broken and they're investing in fossil fuels and arm industries like companies like BIA Systems, Nestle and so on. The list is very long and we somehow know about the problem. And um, banks are hiding the story behind the money. So people don't know that um, what is happening with their money. And um, we want to change that. 
and we want to want to talk about it because like people are changing their behavior in different ways of lives and different um, dimensions like buying organic foods and more for fair fashion and not using plastic bottles anymore and so on but um they are not thinking about banking even if it's if it's a really really easy way to to um do change and to contribute to this um, brighter, greener, diverse future. And um, that's why Tomorrow was founded. Um, as I said before, uh, people are um, thinking about more sustainable um, dimensions and possibilities in different ways of life, but uh, not uh, mostly not um, when they're thinking about money. And that's um, why we thought that it is a really, really good and important thing to add purpose to people's bank account because we believe that money can be part of the solution instead of remaining and financing the problem and um, that's, that's why we want to empower people um, to use their money to create better and create positive change and um, yeah to somehow enable people to put their money where their mind is and um, yeah, there are like two. A lot of people know about bad banks, and in Germany, I don't know if you know, there's a pretty pretty nice series about um, the about what bad banks are doing with the money. And um, there's a long story to it, but I want to come to the solution now instead of talking about the problem anymore. And because we have built a product, a current account. Um, that is doing the complete opposite. So not bad banking, but good banking. And um, to um, by doing this, we are yeah had uh, have created since um, two and a half years. We've created this um, product, um, which is really really deeply connected to our mission. And um, it is a current account that works for positive change. It is 100% sustainable. It is free, um, easy to use. Everyone can open it up just in 10 minutes, sitting um, on the um, on the kitchen table, on the sofa, or whatever, wherever. And um, yeah, this is how we want change to be, and how we think that. Um, Banking needs to be still convenient for people and needs to be smart and transparent and sustainable. So to find a really, really good and easy product to um, to make people change their bank accounts and actually so to um, get the money away from all those bad things happening out there. And um, yeah, this is why we're using the um, comfort of digital banking to um, come closer to our to our idea of a better tomorrow. And um, therefore, we're using um, technology and um, making people's life easier to make our, all our lives on tomorrow and on our future easier and better. And um, yes, yeah, so there's like the, the individual tomorrow and the common tomorrow of us all together. And we want to change that by doing like a really, really easy change by individual behavior. And um, another thing we have introduced like nearly a year ago is a current account which offsets your climate footprint. So it's the first thing that um, is offsetting the uh, footprint like it's 11 tons um, of every, everyone in, in Europe and Germany. And um, we are offsetting this with your um, bank account. And we want to uh, get a connection between what you are consuming and what you're doing with your money. And there's something happening on the other side. And um, with every um, card transaction and every card payment, um, every customer from tomorrow is like saving trees in the, um, in the Amazonia, Amazonas region uh, in Brazil. And this is just just an idea. It's like some kind of a lifestyle piece. This wooden debit card from Visa that um, you can sh show somehow show off with, um, but in a good way and showing that that where your mind is and um, how our tomorrow should be. Yeah, this is like briefly said our mission, and um, the market is ready for tomorrow. Like I don't know. I think some of us are experiencing the same problem or the same. Um, things there that the market is huge, but really, really few people do really change and um, really um, are willing to change their personal behavior to make our, our future brighter, better, greener. 
Uh, but uh, this is why we want to um, find a convenient solution to make it easy for people to be part of the of the revolution of the movement. And um, this is why we are yeah we have um, designed our product for free, easy to use for everyone to come with us and do this change and get all the money from the bad banks away from the destructive industries and projects. But uh, here, but to a brighter future. Yeah, I think this is all it. That's just like a, a, a small thing, like my colleague added here. So if any of, of you wants to join this movement tomorrow, you can um, open up an account using the code DOPPER and we are um, compensating one ton of CO2 for you. And um, you can open up an account all over Europe. And um, it's at the moment not in um, or only in English and German, but I think it should be it should work for all of you. And um, yeah, I think ready for the question Miriam has in place for me. I'm, I don't know if I, I should answer to uh, to the questions here. It's at the moment it's not UK because it's only the Euro countries, but I can write all the answers later here in the chat. Thank you so much. Super interesting. And I completely get the point of like creating a product that is making the making it as easy as possible for people to be more sustainable. I think we literally very aligned there, thinking alike. There is a question um, that we got. How is Tomorrow Bank being perceived in the German banking world? Yeah, this is a good question because it's like a, some, some, um, it's not some bad banks world there. I think, um, so first of all, we haven't invented the whole idea of sustainable banking. They are like banks like the GLS, uh, in Germany and there are some others triodos in um, European or international um, markets they they are doing this this work since the last 20 years or so so we haven't invented this but we have made it smart and transparent and easy to use and this is the problem that it's still at the moment sustainable banking is still the niche and we want to get it out of the niche and um, this is um, I think people so the industry is realizing it and they are seeing us but still um uh, there's there's just like i think we are not perceived as the um the danger or so but they are they are realizing that we are kind of kicking their asses in the future really nice yeah i hope you will grow and really you know uh kick their ass <laughs> Okay, let's move over to the second speaker. Lily, thank you very, very much. Um, Lisa from Waterbear, if you could uh, unmute yourself. Yes. Hi. Hi, yeah. everyone. Uh, so I will bring up my screen. Oh, it says open in browser or run in the app. I'll open in the browser. Okay. So here we go. Can you see that? Oh, hang on, I don't wanna do that. I wanna present it. Ha. Huh. Okay, can you see that? I'm gonna to wait to hear a yes, otherwise I'm not sure it's working. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, good, okay, cool. Um, so, hi, I'm the head of impact at Waterbear and we are a brand new um, digital storytelling platform. Uh, well, um, you may ask, what, what the hell is that? Uh, we're dedicated to saving the planet, basically. And it's a, a video streaming platform with a difference. Uh, it's been said that it's like Netflix for nature. Um, but I think it's even cooler than that because we don't want you to just Netflix and chill. We want you to water bear and act. So uh, with radical solutions in mind, I wanted to tell you a little bit about why water bear is a radical creature. Uh, firstly, starting with the name, what is a water bear? It's actually a tiny little microscopic creature um, that can basically survive in pretty much any condition, even in space and they are extremely resilient creatures. They can even fall asleep for many years and then uh, spring back to life again. Um, I wish I could do that. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna tell you uh, all about the platform. Um, firstly, um, 
why are we doing a new platform? Does the world really need uh, another kind of streaming video platform? Um, we think it does uh, because we think we're very different to other ones that are on offer. Um, and it's really passion that has led us here. So we are birthed by a production company called Off The Fence that makes films often about the natural world. And our CEO grew tired of being told what she could broadcast and about the state of the planet and what she couldn't. So she thought she'd create her own online network that also encourages people to take action to make the world a better place. So this has actually been a concept that she's been planning for quite some time. And now she's brought a team of us on board to help her, her bring it to life. And we, um, we launched in December. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, it's available on the iOS and Android app stores. And also it's available on the internet. There are some countries, unfortunately, where you cannot access Water Bear right now, but we are rolling out across Europe within the next few weeks. So by the end of March, uh, if you're in Belgium, you'll definitely be able to get it. Uh, if you are in the UK or the Netherlands or Germany or Denmark, uh, then you can definitely get on and you can download the apps. Uh, we're also available in the US, Canada, uh, South Africa, Ireland, and Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, but we're rolling out uh, across the world basically um, as soon as we can. I don't know if you remember, but Netflix uh, was only available in certain regions at first, and that's due to many reasons. Um, but firstly, I want to just start off with this quote from Jane Goodall. Um, we are partnered with the Jane Goodall Institute on Water Bear, and she's definitely one of the most inspiring people that we know of. And we've really taken her lead here in what we're doing. Um, she says, the only way you can make somebody change their mind isn't by arguing with them. It's not by telling them they're bad. You've got to find a way to reach the heart. And the best way to reach the heart is telling stories. Don't be aggressive. Nobody will change if you're aggressive. They've got to want to change from within. So that's basically what we're really trying to do here at Water Bear. Um, and we really feel that stories are a way of shifting people at scale across the world. I mean, if you look at things that have happened recently in the world that have really created a lot of change, they're really based around stories and negative stories, destructive stories, fake news, fake stories um, can change elections, can start violent uprisings. Um, but inspiring stories and ones that are told in a, in a really um, powerful way can change the world. I mean, look at the story of Greta, for example. Um, there was a climate movement fueled by youth before Greta uh, stood outside the uh, Swedish parliament with her sign. But it was because of her and the story that was so powerful and, and hit people in the hearts that this small young girl was all by herself sitting, striking from school every Friday. It was so different to anything that anyone had really seen before. And so that story is what ignited the whole youth climate movement to a level that it hadn't reached before. Um, similar in a similar way that the, the US civil rights movement um, was really ignited by the story of Rosa Parks, who was the black woman who refused to give up her seat on the bus for a white man. Now that movement had started before that story happened, but it wasn't really gaining traction. And then after that, there was this massive boycott um, that really forced the government in the US to end um, segregation, uh, legal segregation. So it's really these powerful stories that can cause these massive shifts. And when we launched in December, we were very lucky to have the support of Prince Harry, who immediately recognized uh, what we would wanted to do and saw that as a great value to the whole environmental movement. So he's saying here, you can't uplift ed and educate and inspire unless there is a form of action that follows. So he's sort of saying, you've got the story, but then what are you gonna get people to do? You've got a window to provide an opportunity to act. And that's why Water Bear is so important. So we're matching these powerful stories on Water Bear 
with the tools that people need in order to really create impact in the world. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about how we do that later. But first of all, I'm going to take a bit of a step back and talk about some of the problems that we really would like to try and solve in the world that we think a platform like Waterbear would be really best placed to do. So we, at the moment, there's a lot of doom and gloom. Um, we've got children suffering from eco-anxiety. We've got people who are literally, you know, very terrified about what's going on in the world and feeling very depressed and helpless about it. Um, so there's a lot of disenchanted young people, there's a lot of fake news flying around, nobody quite knows what to do. There's a lot of different NGOs out there and solutions all over the place leading to sort of like fragmented support for lots of causes. And there's generally a lack of capacity for compelling and high quality storytelling um, that we feel can really dramatically shift hearts and minds across the world. So overall, we feel that even though there is a growing movement for change and there's lots of awareness being raised and there's things like Extinction Rebellion happening and there's all kinds of exciting stuff going on. In general, we feel like it could be it could be so much more powerful than it already is. And and we just feel like we want to try and help and boost the movement to make the world a better place in any way we can. So let's get radical. Our solution at Water Bear is to build a community of millions who are inspired to act by these great stories and create impact through a network of over 100 NGO partners, all on one cutting edge interactive platform. So already uh, before we even launched, we had over 80 uh, NGOs signed up to the platform and we will be uh, over 100 uh, very shortly. Uh, we have many big um, impact partners involved, such as Greenpeace and Conservation International and Sea Shepherd. We've also got really little ones um, that need lots of help and support. So we're sort of using the big guns or the bingos, as they're sometimes known, big NGOs, um, to, to draw in that kind of initial community and support and attraction by their big brands and help support other smaller NGOs and create this kind of one-stop shop where people can come and find out about various different important issues in the world and how they can take action. And hopefully through being entertained, through being told a jolly good story, um, we're really hoping to see that we can really drive people towards taking action, especially people who haven't necessarily ever signed up to an NGO before, subscribe to a newsletter from Greenpeace or signed a petition um, with Client Earth or, you know, that these kinds of actions, we're really looking to help expand uh, audiences uh, beyond the current echo chamber of, of NGO communities. So we've also got these sort of like seven key goals that we're trying to, to achieve with Water Bear. One is to produce amazing inspirational content, which I was just talking about. Then we want to centralize it all in a beautiful, easy to use platform and showcase the work of these organizations that I was just talking about, give them a space where they can uh, spotlight their own existing content. And then we're also working together with them to produce new, amazing short films um, to help them tell their stories. Uh, we want to empower local communities and, and um, use local talent across the world wherever we can. And we're using our technology on the platform to really create and engage a growing community of people who want to take action. Um, we want to create impact on the ground. Um, we certainly don't want to just look like we're doing stuff on Water Bear and not having any real concrete action. So part of my role is to really make sure that we're creating that change that we want to see in the world. Um, and we do this by partnering with these NGOs, but also generally just looking at all of the sustainable development goals and seeing um, which ones need the most support and how are we uniquely placed to help support those goals. Um, one of the ways which Water Bear is being fueled is through a new nonprofit foundation that we've set up called Resilient. And we're going to big donors and asking them to support uh, what we're doing on Water Bear to help NGOs. So we want to um, use that money to support more amazing productions and stories being told on Water Bear. Um, and 
deliver these kind of high impact documentary films with purpose. Um, and so that's about that's a bit about the Resilient Foundation. Um, this is a sneak peek at what Water Bear actually looks like. You'll get a much better view um, if you look at it on your phone. I can also just pull it up quickly on my phone. Um, I do recommend the app experience. It is beyond what the website version can offer. Um, so as you, you load the front page, it very much does look like Netflix. Um, it's very intuitive. There's these rows of videos that you can watch. And uh, we've done uh, an interview with Jack Harris, who is quite a famous YouTube uh, person, influencer. Um, and he's uh, talking about all the stuff that he's doing for the environment. So you can watch that. We also interviewed Maisie Williams recently. Um, this one, I re highly recommend An Eye for Detail. It's a story about an amazing wildlife photographer who has autism and how the photography has really helped him through the struggles uh, with being bullied at school and, um, and really just helped him to, to be the best person that he can be. Um, so that's a bit about what Water Bear looks like. Now, we've not only got this amazing content, we're connecting people with all these different NGOs through everybody, all of these NGOs having like their own space on the platform, which we're promoting for them. Um, it's for free. So if you're an NGO and you want to join Water Bear, please reach out to me. My contact details at the end of the presentation. Um, and we'd love to speak to you about it. If you're um, just wanting to become a member, that's also free. There will be some documentaries that you will have to pay a few euros to watch. But apart from that, the whole platform is free to get on to and watch all of this amazing content. Um, we then have ways that you can support the NGOs through donating, uh, discovering volunteer opportunities, sharing their content, uh, purchasing sustainable travel experiences. There will be some uh, e-commerce on the platform soon. Uh, I think we're going to be selling Dopper bottles, which is really exciting. And um, and we'll be doing lots of live events once those things are actually happening in the world again. Um, so there's some really cool interactive te technology on the platform. The one part that I really like, uh, and luckily I like it because I'm responsible for editing it all and putting it together, is uh, what we call the Water Bear Connect timeline. And as you watch a piece of video content, there are these cards that pop up um, and you can push them away if you would rather not have them on your screen, but they pop up when there gets to a point in the film where you would most likely want to give some money or read more, find out more. Um, and those connect you to our partners on the platform or they may link out so that you can sign a petition. And all of that happens uh, while you're watching the video. Um, or you can save things to read later into your list. Um, so this is just a bit more about the NGOs that we're working with at the moment. They are mostly focused on wildlife conservation and climate change. But as we move into the second half of this year, we're gonna be focused on circularity and sustainable innovation. So we will be doing a lot um, of things around plastic pollution and alternatives to plastic packaging. Um, we have recently just signed up with the Break Free From Plastic movement. Um, and we also have, um, trying to think of other ones that work on that issue that we're partnered up with. Well, Client Earth does a lot of great stuff on this and also Greenpeace. Um, oh, we're working with Lonely Whale, um, a big fan of theirs. They do amazing, amazing stuff on, on the plastic pollution issue. Um, and, we, and, and if you would like to recommend any great NGOs to us, then also please do um, send us your suggestions. So this is just uh, a quick intro to our latest ambassadors on Water Bear, uh, Maisie Williams, uh, you probably know her as Aria from Game of Thrones, Jack Harries, who's that famous YouTuber I was just talking about earlier, Lily Cole, who's in the UK, and Maya Rose Craig, who's also over in the UK. Um, the UK is one of our key markets right now, but as we um, branch out and get bigger, we'll be having ambassadors, I hope, from all over the world. Um, so Off the Fence Productions, who sort of gave birth to Water Bear, um, 
they are the filmmakers behind who made My Octopus Teacher, which is the award-winning Netflix film. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. It's just been shortlisted for an Oscar, so we're super excited about that. And on Water Bear, you will find there's another video called My Wild Teacher, and you can join in and find your own teacher in nature and uh, see what you can learn uh, from having these kinds of experiences yourself in nature. And if you, if you go to that page on Water Bear, you can find out, or you can go to mywildteacher.com and you can find out tips from Craig Foster, who's the guy in My Octopus Teacher, um, advising people on how to have a great experience in nature um, and, do, and have something really similar to, to what he experienced. So that's sort of one of our engagement campaigns that we're working on. The other engagement campaign, which we are launching tomorrow, and we're super excited about it, um, it's called Not a Pet. It's, it's gonna be a five episode uh, series of short films about the exotic pet trade and the impact that it has on wildlife. Um, and the series comes out on the platform on the 5th of March, but we're actually launching a campaign together with I4, which is a petition tomorrow. So there's a landing page and that will be, notapet.org um, if you want to go and check that out it will should be up yeah. and by tomorrow am i running out of time conscious of time yes because we yes. still want to ask questions yeah fine i'm i'm at the end just wanted okay. to say there's also a really great um opportunity coming up we are partnered with the Aegean Film Festival um, to re-script the future. And uh, if you write a script and enter it into this competition, then the top two ones that win uh, will be made into short films. And so um, you, you can find out about this if you just Google Aegean Film Festival script writing competition, but we're partnered up with them and that's something we're really excited about as well. Thank you, Doppa. Um, thank you for having me. And yeah, as I said, if you have any ideas or you'd like to join Water Bear if you're an NGO, please do drop me a line. Thanks. Let me go back and find you. Awesome. Thank you. Super interesting. Wow. Love the presentation. A lot thank of information. Thank you so much. And you will probably have like 100 plus new members this weekend. Uh, I definitely know what I'll be doing this weekend. Thank you for the recommendations as well. We got a um, question from the audience. Um, what's your marketing strategy to ensure that a very wide audience, instead of only, let's say, the believers mm -hmm. so already think and act green, will join your platform? Super good question. Something that we're thinking about all the time because uh, we definitely need the deep greens to get us going. Um, we want to be a place where they can come and, and share stuff with their friends who may not be as deep green as them. Um, but we really do want to reach out to these people who we feel like are on the cusp of being engaged, but just not quite there yet and could be inspired by all of these stories. So the way that we're trying to reach out to them is by actually making content that we think that they would like. So a lot of the stuff we're trying on Water Bear isn't your traditional kind of campaigning film that Greenpeace might produce. It's done in a way that's often quite lighthearted and fun uh, and adventurous um, and sometimes funny. And so and the, our social media channels are also really designed for this kind of audience. Uh, we're really targeting younger demographics, 18 to 35, millennials, Gen Zs. So you'll notice if you follow us on Instagram, um, you'll see that kind of marketing that we're doing. And then you can see with our ambassadors, we've chosen them because we feel like they would be right for that kind of audience. And then we're also doing a lot of kinds of uh, PR and live events that we feel will also target those individuals. And the, the, the campaign that we're launching tomorrow, we're focused on promoting it through TikTok. And we are reaching out to influential folks on TikTok and asking them and giving them guidelines on how they can promote this campaign. And then we're building this landing page where you can come and sign the petition and, and join Water Bear at the same time. Wow. Sounds like you're also really busy and it's really... Uh, it's really busy. <laughs> really, really cool. Thank you for sharing. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Um, if you could turn now your microphone off and your um, camera. And then we move to our last speaker, Lola. Please join us. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm quickly gonna share my screen as well. And then I'm gonna put it on presentation mode. Okay, there we go. 
Um, so hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here and I want to thank Lisa and Lily for their extremely interesting presentations. I'm also so excited for Water Bear to be available in Belgium. Um, and also I'd like to thank Dopper for giving me a place to share my story, but mostly the story of my movement, which is Youth for Climate, as you can tell, but most of you might know it as Fridays for Future, since that is the international name, but it's the same thing, we just call it a bit different here in Belgium. Um, but I thought it might be nice if I quickly introduce myself. This is me. My name is Lola. I'm a 19 year old climate and human rights activist. And this was me when um, I didn't shave my hair off yet and I was still able to shout in the streets. Um, and I've been involved in the movement for about two years now. I spend all my free time on working on actions and campaigns, building the movement, but just in general, of course, tackling the climate crisis. Um, and I do that for my future, but even more importantly, for the present of a lot of people that are already suffering from the consequences of climate change. And the quote you can see here is something I strongly live by. And that's that I don't want to accept the things that I cannot change, but I want to change those things that I cannot accept. And inequality and climate change and the future that's ahead of us, I will simply not accept and really try my ultimate best to change it. So this is kind of what our movement looks like. A lot of young people shouting in the streets while they're actually supposed to be at school. Um, and in Belgium, it started after seeing Greta's story and seeing how she was in front of her parliament all by herself. And we were like, no, that girl needs some help. So we made a video in the beginning of 2019 asking all youth from Belgium to join us in the street on a Thursday. And it ended up going pretty well. There were 3000 people that first Thursday and after a week there were 15,000 people and the third week there were already 30,000 people in the streets and um, we did, did that for 20 weeks in a row until the Belgian elections and we saw that during those first weeks the, the weeks the whole movement was growing so much in Europe but all over the world people were starting to strike every Friday that's also why it's called Fridays for Future and Youth for Climate in Belgium because we did it on Thursdays and um, but we, we were kind of everywhere. The media also finally started talking about climate change, not only about our strikes, but really what the problem was and what the effects of climate change would be. Um, and we kind of caused that by doing something that had never happened before. A school strike was a totally new concept and it was so big that we even organized the biggest climate strike in history of humankind, which took place in May 2019. And there are over 1.5 million people all over the world in the streets. Um, over, like, I think there were 125 countries participating in over 1,600 cities, which I am pretty proud of, and I thought it's pretty impressive. Um, but after a couple of weeks, we saw that it already became a bit harder to get the same attention and to keep the big numbers going. So the numbers slowly started dropping, and we had to come up with new ideas to keep this topic in the media and to give it the attention it needed. So we had to be a bit more creative and think of new things that we could do besides striking. So we organized an occupation for climate, which we did in the Rue de la Loi, which is the most important street, political street in Belgium. It's also a neutral zone. You're absolutely not allowed to strike there. But we actually slept there for two nights to um, put pressure on the climate law that was being voted. It ended up not getting voted, but at least we tried. Um, we also started talking to scientists and leaders, like on this picture you can see that there's some you talking to Franz Timmermans, but we also talked to some national leaders and also um, just people in power and people that were important to do their job. Um, and we also started organizing campaigns like the Vote for My Future campaign, which was a European um, international campaign where we went into the European Parliament twice. Once we did a die-in and once we did the sit-in, um, and we also organized different sort of strikes, like an international strike with youth from all over Europe, um, which was actually right before COVID. Um, so we were very happy that we were still able to do that. And all of this we did to get as many people as possible on our side and to involve as many as people as possible. So we tried to convince everyone that climate change doesn't have a political color and that whatever you believe in or whatever you stand for, climate change will affect you and you cannot just escape that. So that's why we always try to come up with new things, come up with new actions to include as many people as possible 
and getting people on our side and making them excited and also believe in our story and wanting to be part of it. Um, so that's why we try all these kind of different things. But when COVID happened, it all became a little harder. Um, we um, didn't only want to try to get everyone on our side, but we also had to see that there was this other huge crisis that obviously needed a lot of attention, but we didn't want the climate crisis to be fully forgotten because that was also still going on. Um, so again, we had to be more creative and adapt to the situation. We organized um, online strikes, we organized social distancing strikes, like you can see here on the picture in front of the European Commission, where we were actually striking um, against the CAP, which is common agricultural policies, um, which suck, by the way. So we were, of course, striking against that. Um, and then our last thing that we did was this campaign Fight for 1.5. Um, where we um, went into the streets and put all over the world, we put um, candles on the ground in this, like you can see the hashtag one, fight for 1.5. Um, it was very international, a lot of countries did that. And we tried to make it very accessible for people so people could light a candle, take a picture and we could post that on our social medias. And the message behind this that was that we wanted to humanize the climate crisis and this number 1.5, what does it mean? What does it do to people? Um, but actually, the, the main message of our movement is we want a system change. And as something we always sing in the streets is change the system, not the climate. And that's one of my favorites. Um, we, but we see, though, that this is very hard for the ones who need to make the biggest change, like leaders and bigger companies, to understand this and to agree that we really need and want the system change. I think it scares them because they will lose the control of the system that they're so used to living in. Um, but the system we live in thrives of, on inequality and exploitation. And we're learned to manipulate our systems in such a way to meet these impossible demands of humankind. And, and we started to believe that it's normal that for to, to tip on our demands, we need exploitation, modern slavery and, and def, def, deflation, that that is all required for this. It seems like there are no boundaries and that we can just push Earth's limits to infinity without experiencing any consequences of it. But that's exactly the cause of climate change. Climate change is the direct result of acting like our planet is inexhaustible. Um, many people would agree with me when I say that innovation could be a solution for the climate crisis. For example, we have BEX, which is bioenergy with carbon capture storage, which really simply means that the bioenergy the, the CO2 produces, you just get out of the atmosphere and you put it under the ground or carbon capture and storage, which basically is the same. You capture um, CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it underneath the ground. Um, but the thing with those two is that it costs a lot of money and to create this on a global scale, it will still take too much time and time we just simply don't have. But another way that we could get, at, get CO2 out of the atmosphere is by stopping deforestation and by planting more trees. And it's also a way of tackling the climate crisis, but at the same time, making this world a better place. While I don't believe that Bex and CCS do that, I just don't believe in that. Um, so I believe that innovation can be part of the solution for solving this crisis, but it's also a way of holding on to something that just simply won't last. Climate change has shown us that the current system that we live in and our way of living is just unsustainable for for humankind so what we we why do we always find it so important to hold on to it why do we want to keep the system so badly is it really what we want or is it just because we don't really know any better if you give your mind the freedom for a second to think outside of this current system away from everything you've ever known i just don't believe that any of us would rebuild this exact system again I think many of us would like to see something different. And something a bit related to this is that I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community. And after coming out of the closet and finding that such a weird thing to do that you had to say on what gender you were in love with, I find that such a weird thing. I also realized how amazing it is to decide to break that box that you were put in from the beginning of your life and decide that that was just not you and that I was someone else and that I wanted to break that box. Um, because once I also realized how many things were put into my head from the beginning of my life, like expectations and hopes, I also started realizing how beautiful it is 
to make your own rules and decide your own boxes and question also the ones that you were put in beforehand by others. And from the movement, fr from the moment we're born, there are so many things already decided for us. We believe, uh, I believe that you can see the current system as one big box that we all live in and believe in. And because we just don't really know anything else. But if you give yourself a moment to question this and to allow yourself to let go of everything you've ever known, you're able to decide your own rules and your own boxes and your own system. And for example, I believe in a world where equality is the norm and where we treat the world like our home instead of an inexhaustible bank of money and sources. It's something I also want to believe in and want to fight for because it's about the future of humankind. And I want to decide that I don't accept the future that's ahead of us, but I want to change that future to change it. And um, that's why I want to ask you, if you close this webinar, um, to give yourself a moment to think completely free and dream, dream of a world you would like to live in. And once you came up to this idea of this, this conclusion of what system you'd like to live in, I would like to ask you to start make it happen. Um, thank you so much. This is the end slide a bit. There you can see the social media of Youth for Climate. If you would like to follow us and see what we're doing, and you can also see my email address if you have any questions or if you want to reach out. But thank you so much. I'm going to close this PowerPoint. And stop sharing. Right, that should be good. Wow, thank you so much. I feel truly inspired. And honestly, when you mentioned in the beginning the numbers, like I got goosebumps. Like, wow. Um, and there is actually a related question that I found really interesting. It was from the chat. We know that there are some plans again in, in uh, March. So fingers crossed. So the question is, what's the plan for the big strike in March? Um, if you can actually strike outside and can we at DOPA help? That's a good question. Unfortunately, we're not allowed at all to strike in big numbers yet in Belgium. And I don't think in a lot of countries it's possible right now. So we're again doing a smaller action with Youth for Climate, like the more internal group. Um, I can not tell a lot about it, but again, follow the social media if you would like to see what we're planning on doing. But we're definitely doing something and we're also preparing our first really big strike after once COVID allows it again. Um, so fingers crossed that that won't take too long anymore. But I'm very looking forward and I think a lot of people are looking forward to go back onto the streets. Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, now we're moving over to our Q&A. So it means for guests, um, if you have more questions, drop them in the chat so I can read them. For everyone of the speakers, if you join us, please. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Lily. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> Let's see what we have in questions. Lily, I have a question for you. Um, how does Tomorrow Bank, as a sustainable business, ensure that it makes sufficient money? Uh, yeah, this is a really, really good question because like, we want to be a sustainable company as well and um, earn money. At the moment, we are, um, we, we, it's a really, really um, heavy to finance this and we are working with impact investors and we are not earning money right now. So we're pretty transparent with this that we, are, so we won't be earning um, money in the next three or five years to five years or so. So at the moment we are not, but um, we, are, we definitely will be keeping the free current account, but we will offer some more premium accounts, insurances, and some, some other products. So um, this is how we wanna, wanna earn money in the future, but right now we are not doing it, but we are working with impact and investors, which we are also um, yeah, showing and communicating transparently on the website. That's interesting, thank you. Um, Lola, I have a question for you. When has the goal of Youth for Climate been reached? Um, I think when we can safely say that there is a safe future ahead for everyone and not just our generation, but all generations coming. Um, of course, we don't have that specific goal. We're asking a lot of things, but those are, again, a system change. When do you reach a system change? We don't really know that, but we're just 
doing whatever we can to fight for this future that we are all dreaming of and wanting for our children and grandchildren. Um, so I don't think there's actually an end goal, especially in my lifetime, I don't think I'll ever reach that goal. But of course, we'll keep on fighting to just get there at some point. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Um, Lisa, now I have a question for you. In what ways are you working with indigenous peoples to amplify native voices? Yeah, amazing question. Um, so my uh, thing that I'm most excited about on that uh, is that we are hopefully, go all goes well, uh, making a video production to show how an amazing plan that's now backed by scientists from around the world actually started with an in indigenous community, um, which is called the Global Deal for Nature. So if you type in globaldealfornature.org, um, this is a plan to protect half the planet that's backed by science and indigenous communities from all over the world. So it's one of the most exciting campaigns that you can add your support for. Um, so we're going to be making a video production around that. Uh, we also work with an NGO called Rainforest Concern, and they work very closely with indigenous um, communities, uh, specifically in the Amazon. Um, and we are talking to them about potential stories that we can help them tell. Sorry, I've got my daughter calling me. What's up? <laughs> it's one. <laughs> if she knows the best time to ask me for snoopies, for sweets, is when I'm on a call. Uh, she's learned that, because I, I can't say no, because then she'll argue with me. Um, so yeah, so we are we are doing um, our best to reach out to indigenous communities. It's very hard to make films with them right now because obviously they have to be extremely careful about COVID. Um, but we do support NGOs that work with indigenous communities. I've only listed a couple. Um, there's many more. So if you go to Waterbear and you click on our connect section, um, there you can scroll through all the NGOs and many of them do work with indigenous communities. Someone in the chat recommended Survival International. They're definitely on my list of, uh, of NGOs to add to the platform. So thank you for that suggestion and reminder. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we have some more questions. Lily, one more for you. Um, what is the biggest obstacles of your growth for Tomorrow Bank? Um, honestly, I think it's people's laziness um, doing, doing changing the bank account. So I think it's like um, uh, people are yeah talking and doing some changes, but um, still individuals are sometimes pretty lazy. And I don't know, if Lola, how you are experiencing it. But um, individuals like are not that easy to get, even if if you are having the same point. But like creating movement is sometimes exhausting, and I think it's something we are experiencing with growth as well as well. But I think I think it's getting better, but uh, it's an obstacle probably every social business has. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe can I ask a question to you, Lola? Because we are like pretty well connected to the Fighters for Future com community in Germany as well. And um, I often get asked, like, what is the best thing you can do as an individual or a company to support you guys? Because I think it's like a lot of people are totally feeling the vibe, but feel a bit like they don't know how to how to support. And maybe some of the um, the guests here are also experiencing this challenge. Yeah, that, that's a good question. What we often hear is a lot of applause and people supporting and being like, "Wow, you're doing such a great job." But I don't think those people realize that that's not at all what we want. We want them to act and do their part. Because like I said in the presentation, every single person will have to do their part because else we won't reach those goals that we want to reach. Um, so for companies and for bigger like organizations, I think it's important to, to do their part, to inform people, to make their own buildings or their own way of doing things just more sustainable in every single way possible. Um, but even as an indi individual, there's so many things you can do in your in your own lifestyle. Like there's the basic things we all know them, like making sure you isolate your house, that you turn off the the heat, that you are a vegetarian or a vegan, that you take the bike. You know all those things. But also join a movement. Try to get in there. Use your social media platforms to share about climate change, to inform people, to act on it, and to really try and bring this topic really wide and big like we are all trying to do but it's just getting harder and harder to find people like to make it interesting for people so we need everyone to 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 inform and to talk and to 
just try and do everything that's in your power and especially join the movement there's the friday star future movements are super easy to join um you can just go to the websites and often there's a form that you can fill in because that's the fun thing you can so easily join there's nothing you have to do and with often bigger ngos or organizations it's sometimes a bit harder to get involved while with youth for climate or friday star future it's actually pretty easy so if you're interested definitely go check that out Thank you. I think we definitely will do that. Very interesting question as well. Um, being aware of time, I think we have to sneak in one more question. Um, Lisa, one more question for you. Um, how do you want to create an impact on the ground? So any initiatives you can share already or examples you can give? Yeah, for sure. So um, we we want to help create impact in uh, as many ways as possible at different scales. So um, if I step back and look at the whole world, um, we're supporting some really big initiatives. The Global Deal for Nature is one, one of them I just mentioned. Uh, there's another one that we want to try and help support as much as we can called 30 by 30. So that's protecting 30% of the oceans by 2030. So these are like big impact at global scale kind of policies that are happening at decision making moments um, biodiversity summits coming up in may in china um, and often the best thing that we can do is really create global legislation to protect vast areas of the planet and get national governments on board to, to pledge uh, make ambitious pledges and then we're also supporting things at a very local level so right now you can adopt a um, uh, you know you can like adopt an elephant or support um, uh, rangers in Africa um, through the organization Tusk. Um, so we're kind of doing like big scale uh, campaigns and also very local things where you can really like send money directly for a specific project on the ground that you want to support. Wow, nice. Thank you for sharing. It sounds really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, so we're coming to the end of this event. If you can just one more time uh, mute yourself and leave the camera or turn the camera off, please. I don't know about you guys, but wow, I feel so super inspired. And I just wanted to thank especially the speakers and everyone who attended tonight so much on behalf of the entire DOPA team. Um, if you want to get involved in our movement at the moment, uh, the DOPA Wave, so our movement against single-use plastic, please scan the QR code and get involved. Um, yeah, right. I hope you all feel as inspired and optimistic and really, yeah, like, Starting this new this year new one more time um, with lots of ideas, lots of solutions in your head. Um, we are already looking forward to see you at our next event. So please stay tuned. Uh, we will announce it soon. Thank you very much for joining. Bye bye.